what would it look like if Jesus lived in our town right now? What would it, how, would, how would life in our town be different? And we learned the first week, uh, several weeks ago, that he does. Because we, the followers of Jesus, we are the body of Christ. And that metaphor, body of Christ, is intentional. We are the tangible presence of Jesus in the world. And if we are not being Jesus' tangible presence, who will? Nobody. We are. The Holy Spirit fills us. The Holy Spirit is going before us in the lives of people all around. And he's saying, all right, I've done my part. I'm not asking you to change anybody's life. I'm not asking you to transform their soul. I'm not asking you to do any of that. I'm asking you to be my hands and feet. Serve them. Love them. I'll take care of the rest. That's what we're talking about in this series. So what does that look like in a practical way? Because last week we talked about how we can't do it by ourselves. It takes a community of people. It's all of us. Almost every time the word you is mentioned in Scripture, it's never talking about you as an individual. It's always this plural, you all, and we so often read it as just us. And so how do we, how do we as one people in Jesus impact the world around us? And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, in my 30s, which seems like so long ago, but in my 30s, we started a church in Central Florida. And I was there for about 10 years, and um, me and another guy started it together, and he was the lead pastor for a couple of years, and then when he left, I became the lead pastor, which I'm still not sure that was the smartest thing the church ever did, but that's where we were. And um, I was told by a good friend of mine when the church and I were praying about me becoming the lead pastor, and, and a friend of mine said, you know, when you, if you become the lead, you're going to be incredibly lonely. He said, you're going to feel like you're, you, nobody has your back. You're going to feel like you're in this all by yourself. And so I, I asked, how do I prevent that? <laughs> I don't want that. And he said, it's just the way it is. Leadership is a lonely place. I got to tell you, seriously, that advice affected me deeply, so deeply that I almost said no, because I don't, I, that is so not what I, I see in, in Scripture and what it look, it's supposed to be like. But Raylan and I prayed, and we strongly believed that we were supposed to lead this, this church. And you know what I found out about my friend's advice? He could be right. He could be, because a lot of pastors feel that way. A lot of pastors feel alone, that nobody supports them. Nobody has their back. And a lot of pastors end up being burnt out. A good friend of mine in, in Sun Prairie just about six months ago Started a church 10 years later. He left the church and he told them, I'm so sorry, I've been burnt out for the last two years and I've never told you. And so he left. So I learned that it could be that way, but I also learned that it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be this way. Being alone for all of us, not just pastors, is a choice. But if you don't choose intentionally to be in community, the choice is made for you. You're going to be alone. You choose loneliness. Usually we choose loneliness because we don't know any better. I mean, our culture is not designed for community. Our culture is designed for you to, you know, do life, pick up, your, you know, on your, own, on your own steam, go. You can do it. It's all about you. We don't know any better, and so we don't foster community. We, we lead alone. We live alone. So that was the point of last week's talk. But this week, I wanted, to, I wanted to share a story with you. It's actually from the Old Testament, which is just funny that you see this kingdom picture in the Old Testament about how do we do that? How do we live life in community? Okay, last week was, yes, we need to. Great. What do we do? Because it's so countercultural. How do we stop doing life as individuals? So we're going to look at a story by Moses of all places where, because he tried to lead alone. He tried to do life alone, and it didn't work. But God led him to change. Provide such a powerful example for us today. So we're going to be in numbers. You know, of course, when you're talking about kingdom in the church, let's go to numbers. And, uh, and we're going to be in chapter 11. If you have your Bible, feel free to open that. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background first. Because early in the Bible, God chose a man named Abraham and his descendants. That's how God was going to make himself known in the world. And Abraham couldn't have children, but God promised him a son, and he miraculously had Isaac, who had a son, or many sons, and had sons, and on and on. 
But after several generations, these descendants were put into slavery in Egypt. And if you've ever seen Moses, you know, with uh, Charlton Heston or the Prince of Egypt, you see some great pictures of what that looked like. But while they were in slavery, the population exploded. But this torment of slavery lasted hundreds of years till finally God rescued them. And the story of the rescue is called the Exodus. And it's, it's, it's chronicled in the next four books of the Bible after Genesis. And uh, this story is where God raises up a man named Moses to lead the people who are now called the Israelites or the Hebrews to the promised land. And that promised land is now, it's in modern day Israel. So I wanted to just show you, people laugh at me with my maps, but that's okay. I wanted to show you about how far they had to walk. It's, it's about, I think, let me see, 400 miles ish that they had to walk so it should have taken them a month or two to get there but they had a couple of hiccups took them 40 years no big deal no big deal they struggled though i mean you're they're in the desert if you have ever been to this area you don't want to be there alone and you don't want to be there without water or a car because it is a long hot sadly dry place and um they struggled with hunger and thirst as you can imagine they were there was gossip and complaining there was division. During this trip, they struggled with faith. And though God was providing all of their needs, I mean, he was providing water when they needed. it, said he led them by cloud in the day and fire by night. Their shoes didn't wear out for crying out loud, which, you know, if your kids are getting upset because they have had the same shoes for nine months, just imagine 40 years. So put it in perspective. God gave them food when they needed it. He provided this, this bread-like substance every morning on the ground, and it was called manna. Now, I'm kind of curious. Any of you Hebrew scholars, does anybody know what the word in the original language, what manna means? Anybody? You love it. It's what is it? That's what manna means. What is it? I mean, you can see, hey, Moses, there's this sticky stuff all over the ground. Manna, what is it? Moses is like, I have no idea. Let's eat. What? <laughs> but that's what they were doing. I guess, you know, you can only eat what is it for so long before you're just done. You know, I was thinking about like Bubba Gump, Forrest Gump, you know, we have barbecue manna and we have boiled manna and broil manna and manna kebabs and manna sandwiches and <laughs> manna salad. And you're like, oh my goodness, enough of the manna. They just wanted meat, you know? <sighs> and so they got mad. They didn't get mad at God, because that would be stupid. <laughs> they got mad at Moses. They were like, you know, this is not what we expected freedom to look like, man. <laughs> we're eating sticky stuff in the mornings, gathering it up all day. And so they started complaining, Moses, take us back to Egypt, because we had that huge variety of slave food back in Egypt. And, you know, what could Moses do? Seriously, think about the position he was in. He's following God the best he can. He didn't have some secret stash of food. They're in the desert for crying out loud, you know? If God didn't provide food, the people starved, period. But Moses was their leader, and there was nobody else to complain to. And he did. He took the blame. It was an impossible situation. So I want you to see how Moses prayed in this situation. We're going to be in Numbers 11, verse 11. And it says, Moses asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all of these people on me? I mean, God, is this punishment for something I've done? Why am I carrying this burden? And he continued in verse 12. Did I conceive these people? I mean, I am not their father. You are. Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land? Who? Who? You promised. This is the land you promised on oath to their ancestors. I mean, you, got, you can understand them. They're complaining, God, these are your people. This is your promise. And then verse 13, where can I get meat for all of these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat, but I can't carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. The bottom line, God, I feel all alone. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. They want me to fix it, but it's out of my hands. I can't. It's impossible. But here's the line that gets me. Look at what he, look at what he says in verse 15. 
If this is how you're going to treat me, God, remember, he's talking to God, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, do not let me face my own ruin. And God, if you have any mercy, please just end my life. I don't want the burden anymore. I can't hang on anymore. I mean, Moses is really battling depression here, isn't he? I mean, he's really at the end of his rope. He feels alone and he feels helpless. And like the expectations, the expectations that have been put on him are just too great for him. He can't do it. Have you ever felt like that? Because I have. Where the expectations put on me are just too much. In fact, I'm being asked to do the impossible. I'm being asked to control things that are out of my control. Man, I think this, measure, this, this, this message is, is for us. You just can't measure up. I mean, maybe you can't be all the things that you feel like your kids need or all the things that your family expects from you. Maybe it's impossible to meet the expectations at work or at school. And you just, you're like, it's too much. I cannot measure up. The weight's too heavy and I'm about to buckle. Because that's where Moses was. He was being crushed by that weight of responsibility. I mean, I don't know how many people were in the desert with him. There's a lot of different numbers out there. But it was a lot of people. And all of these people were looking to Moses saying, help me, help me. We're hungry. We're sick of eating this sticky stuff. What is it? Help us. And he's like, I I ain't a farmer. (laughs) I don't know what to do. He was being crushed. They needed to trust God. See, that's what the people needed to do. But Moses couldn't help make them trust God. They, they, they had seen God rescue them from Pharaoh's, you know, from Egypt. They had witnessed the Red Sea split in two and they walked right down the middle of it. God had been leading them by fire at night and cloud in the daytime. They experienced to the point where they were scared to death God's presence descending onto Mount Sinai and thunder and lightning and earthquakes. I mean, they had seen all of this. Yet they wanted more, just like we all do. And they were demanding it from Moses, and he couldn't give it. It was out of his hands. So he was burnt out. He wanted to give up. And I know we all, we've all felt that way. You know, I, I looked at a survey a couple of years ago that said, and it was through Christianity Today, if I'm not mistaken, that 40% of pastors, 40% are battling depression. And that 47% of their spouses are battling depression in America. That is a high, high statistic. I think the average in the United States is 10%. So four times more and five times more uh, of the spouses. See, as a pastor of a church plant, I, I often felt an intense burden that I couldn't meet this expectation that I had no control over. Um, We didn't have enough money for ministry. We were a new church. You know, we had started a church for people who didn't go to church, and it worked. I mean, we were growing like crazy, but we found out something very, very specific about people who don't go to church who decide to go to church. They don't fund a church. (laughs) They're like, why would we do that? I get it. So we were struggling with money. I remember we went months without a paycheck during certain times. So here my family's struggling The church is struggling, and everybody's looking at me going, I know ministry costs money, and I know we don't have any, but it's your responsibility to get these ministries and make them effective and get them up and running. And it was like, I I, I can't do that. Only God could do that. I felt this burden to transform people's lives. I felt this burden for people to come and to, to accept Jesus, to follow him, and for their lives to be changed. But the reality is I can't do that. I can't transform anybody's life. I can't convince anybody to follow Christ. Only God can do that. The church grows, the body of Christ, the followers of Christ grow when his people pursue him and when his people pursue or love their neighbors and the people around them. That's that's how it grows. Churches grow when people are obedient. I can't make anybody obey God. I can't even get my kids to obey me. You know what I'm saying? How can I get a whole group of people to obey God? I can't. But pastors, they're often expected to grow the church. The leaders, the elders, often expected to grow the church. But the Bible, God, uses a specific metaphor for what the leaders of a church do. They plant and they water. They're like farmers. And then if you look at 1 Corinthians 3, 7, so I'm going to jump ahead to the New Testament real quick. Paul says, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Who makes it grow? 
Only God. Growth is up to God. We plant, we water, God causes the growth. So I can't make anybody live as Jesus' hands and feet, as his body. Yet, lives are changed when his people live as his hands and feet. Jesus draws people to himself when his people live as his hands and feet. See, when, when we try to carry a burden that only God can carry, we become overwhelmed. And you know that because you've tried to carry burdens before that are impossible for you to carry. When Jesus says, be anxious for nothing, it's because he's like saying, I know you can't. You're a mess. You're broken. We all are. We're in process of becoming more and more like Jesus, but we're not there. Be anxious for nothing because <laughs> trust God. He's, you can only do so much. And that's what Moses was feeling. That same feeling is what has caused so many of my friends to leave ministry. That same feeling almost caused me to leave ministry. So leading is lonely. It is, but it doesn't have to be. It's not the way we were designed. It's not for Moses and not for us. So let's get a little bit of hope. Anybody else depressed? I know. I'm like, oh. <sighs> All right. God, what do you want to say to us? Let's look at the next verse in, in the number story. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. So bring me 70 of your most respected people, people who love God and, and others. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they might stand there with you. Verse 17, I will come down. I will speak with you there in the midst of all of those people. I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and I will put it on these other leaders. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. So, I mean, right here, God is saying in the Old Testament, early, early Israel history, you don't have to do life alone. Find trusted people, people who love God and who love other people. Then together, through the power of my spirit, lead the people. Choose to share the load together. Do ministry together. I mean, God was telling Moses, you don't have to be Superman anymore. You don't have to be the Lone Ranger anymore. He's telling us, you don't have to be super mom or super dad or super employee or super business owner or super student. You don't have to because, by the way, I hate to be the one to tell you, you can't. You're not, a, you're just, it's out of your hands. You don't have to do it all alone. You're not alone, God is saying. And again, remember, the you here, it's not just you. You together are not alone. That's why Jesus' prayer later on. I mean, John 17, his, like, his last prayer with his, his disciples together, and he's going to the cross in a couple of hours. They don't even know that yet. And he prays, and what does he pray for? Unity. Unity. One people working together for one purpose. You know, one of Jesus' disciples who were following him, Peter, he wrote, he wrote about this unity, about being one people to, together. He wrote about that in a, in a book in 1 Peter. And what's interesting is he quotes a conversation between God and Moses. This is what he says. But you, all of you, are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. Do you remember what a priest, we've said this several times, a priest is somebody who stands between those who don't know God and God, and they unite them together. You're holding the hand of people, and you're holding the hand of God, and you're saying, I want to bring you two together. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. All of you, Lakeside Community Church, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Lakeside, you are God's special possession. And you have a purpose that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. How many of you came out of darkness? Before you followed Jesus, you're like, I don't even know how I did life. Yeah, out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are chosen to bring glory to God and pleasure to God by bringing light into the world. And I'm telling you, Algoma is a Sturgeon Bay. I'm not going to say I've screwed up every time. <laughs> all, of the city, all the towns in this area, 
They're beautiful places, but they're desperate for the light of Jesus. They are. And so we've been chosen to bring God's glory, God's light into the lives of people, not for judgment. Judgment happened already on the cross. Jesus was judged. So now we get to bring love and we get to bring purpose and we get to bring hope and we get to bring light and we get to bring serving and meeting needs and helping people. And it's all the, all the penalty has been taken care of on the cross. We get to be his hands and feet in the world as his spirit empowers us. Now, this is what real, I get really excited. So here we go. See, God told Moses, there is no more one spirit-filled leader. Moses, you're not the only guy anymore. Get 70 people and I'm gonna fill those 70 people with my spirit and together you're going to do some amazing things. But compared to what happened in Jesus, that was nothing. Let's look at what happened with Jesus. Because in Acts 2, and this really gets me excited. This is when the day of Pentecost came. Jesus had died, and he had just risen, risen from the dead. He had seen all his people. He saw 500 people at one time. He talked to his disciples. He talked to lots of people, the guys who are on the road to Emmaus. He just shows up and starts walking with them, and they're like, did you hear about this Jesus? What happened to him? And he's like, tell me. And then he started teaching them about all that it meant, and then they recognized, that oh, you're him, and boom, he's gone. And it's like all this stuff happens. And then he, he ascends into heaven, Jesus is gone until he comes back. And he says, wait, because the Spirit's going to come. And when the day of Pentecost came, all the disciples were together in one place. And it says, suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. In verse 3, it says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And who... All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. How many were filled? In the, the number story, how many were filled? Seventy. But now it's all. See, with Moses, it was just the leaders. But in Jesus, it's all of us. We're all filled. Every follower of Jesus has access to the Spirit. Every follower of Jesus is part of the plan to carry the load. Every follower of Jesus has the responsibility to fulfill the purpose of being an ambassador for Jesus. See, this means, and this is exciting for me as a pastor. See, this means that the pastor is no longer the Moses of the church. The elders and the leaders, they're no longer the Moses of the church. We are all Moses. Let me tell you, that's exciting. We are all Moses. The leaders, yes, they have a specific purpose. Does anybody remember what that is? Wish I'd have put it up there. I didn't. In Ephesians, it says that the leaders, their job is to equip the saints for what? Ministry. We are all ministers now. The pastors and the leaders, their job is to equip everybody so that we, are, we all know what to do and how to do this. But we're all Moses now. We're all ministers filled with the Spirit to be used by God for his kingdom to come and his will to be done right here in our midst. That is so exciting. So exciting. We get to love people and care for people and help people because that is our responsibility. That is, what, that is our calling. We get to do that. That's why most of the people you see here on Sunday mornings serving, almost all of them are volunteers. We could not do Sunday morning without almost so many of you, and you're serving and what you've done. All of these ministries happen together because God's people are saying, yes, we're ministers. It's not any one person's job anymore. We are all ministers. We all get to be a part of accomplishing God's purposes in this world. See, this building is not the church and neither are the programs. You are not attending the church this morning. You are sitting among the church this morning. We are the church together followers of christ who work together as one body for one kingdom we get to do this in jesus name it's beautiful so while all the leaders are responsible for equipping being prepared is all of our responsibility yes i hope i hope that i equip you some i mean i hope sunday mornings are a little bit of that but more importantly i hope that when you leave here you feel like you can begin this growth process on your own because we are all now responsible to carry the load and to be prepared. That, that's why I really, you know, 
it is your responsibility as, as an individual and as, as corporately together, all of us, including me, that when we come together, that we're prepared to worship and that our hearts are good and that we've, we've asked for forgiveness and we've extended forgiveness and, and as we've seen needs, we've met them and as we've spent time praying and reading in God's word. See, it's our responsibility. It's no longer feed me, feed me, feed me. It's no, no, no. God, I'm yours. Feed me <laughs> because I want to be a conduit. It's kind of like plugging in the electric plug. It's not I eat, I eat, I eat, I get fat. Oh, no, no, no. It's like I plug into him and I plug into others and I am the conduit for what God wants to do. That's what he's talking about. So how do we figure out what to do? How do, how do we know where we fit? That is a great question. And I really believe, I wish I could tell you from the stage or the, the ground in front of the stage, but I can't. That is something that you have to seek God for. So I want to encourage you this week. Uh, and and you can, there's a card on your seat, and I want you to make sure you, you grab that because I'm going to talk about it in just a minute. And go ahead and grab your connection card too because th- those two things actually have their little bit of a resource this morning. But I want to encourage you this week to read his word and to pray and ask God to open your eyes to the needs around you. Open your eyes to the ways in which you get to be the tangible presence of Jesus in, this, in your town and in your neighborhood and in your family. I want, I want to encourage you to get involved in serving others here, sure, but outside and in your family. There's so many ways you can get involved. Go ahead and pull out that connection card right now because I want to show you. On the back of that, it actually looks a little different. Oh, sorry. Did I screw something up? Well, and you have it, and it'll get up on the screen in a second. But there is a huge list of ways that you can serve. Um, here, there's some of them in the church, of course. I mean, we have the First Impressions Ministry. They make coffee. We have greeters and ushers and everything like that. Um, I, I have a feeling Don is like one of the most amazing ushers. He has given me a bulletin every day since I've been here, except the one where you were watching a baptism. How dare you? And, you know... <laughs> I bet Don would love a break once in a while. Maybe you would like to serve. Don might be going, no, this is, this, is, this is mine. But, you know, maybe not. But we'll fight over it, and it's okay. But, yeah, I mean, youth ministry needs people. Children's ministry needs people. We have small group leaders and men's and women's ministries. Snow shovelers. I mean, come on. Such a big deal. What I'm saying, there's so many ways that we can plug in here. But that's not the end. And what's really cool is that there are a lot of places outside, things that have already been organized for you. Uh, Gordy and Jen in our church had a passion to help families navigate through LGBT issues. Whew. So as a result, they started a ministry called Unconditional Ministries. Beautiful. Well, Scott and Linda, they had a passion to help people who were dealing with cancer. And they created this cancer care ministry. We, we have other ministries, um, Uh, the Good News Club, after-school ministry with students. And there's just so many different ways that people have already said, I see a need, God, help me meet that need, that I have no doubt that they would love people to help them. Some of you, you have a heart for orphans. What what are you doing about it? Some have a heart for the poor. What? How, How are you being Jesus' hands and feet? So many of us wish that somebody would mentor kids who are struggling or or, or help single moms who have car trouble. What what is your passion? What needs do you see? Because people need help. Marriages are struggling. People are hungry. People are fighting addictions. So many are in financial crisis. Maybe you're the one that God wants to rise up to help people. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to take a class. You don't have to start a ministry. Be a minister right where you are. What we're called to do is we're called to take what's in our bucket and dump it in other people's bucket. That's the calling. You have gifts, you have talents, you you have experiences that you need to share. And regardless of the size of your bucket, regardless of how much talent you have or how much knowledge you have or how much experience you have, whether you have it together or not, 
Your job is just to simply dump what you have, what your bucket, into the bucket of other people. Your job is not to fill somebody's bucket. You can't do that. Your job is just to empty your bucket. That's, that's all of our job. That is what's called watering. That's what's called planting. When we do that, the Spirit of God takes what we've dumped and He transforms our life and He transforms the lives of other people. See, the expectation is not fix anything. The expectation is just keep pouring out your bucket. Keep pouring out your bucket. That's the expectation. And you know what? I can do that. See, I can't grow a church. I can't make a bunch of people come and follow Jesus. And this is my, these are my expectations, okay? I know you have different ones. But I can't do all of the, I can't transform people's lives. But I can empty my bucket. And that is so freeing. As a pastor, that prevents burnout. Because I can empty my bucket. Because God keeps filling that thing up. But I can't fill your bucket. All right. So you have that, that connection card. I would encourage you. If there is an area, maybe I would ask you to pray about it. You don't have to do it this week. You can take the connection card home if you need to. But I would ask that you pray about it. And if, if there is an area of ministry, you're like, I would like more information about that, maybe one or two. Check it. Drop it in the box. What I'll do is I'll, I'll try my best to get the leaders of each of these ministries your name. And they, they can let you know what's happening. And, um, and you can go from there. But there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to grab that little card. This is how we're f- going to close today. This little card has a, pr- well, it has a, uh, a statement by the Apostle Paul. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you. And he's talking to the Philippians, uh, a, a, a group of Jesus followers um, uh, who were not Jewish. They were just, they, they had you know, fairly recently come to follow Jesus. And it says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your, what's the next word? Yeah, your partnership. Paul, you're not in this alone. The church at Philippi, you're not in this alone, but our partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What I would like you to do is I'd like you to take this card home and read through this passage of scripture a couple of times this week. But then below that, it gives you something to pray about. And I would encourage you to pray this week. The first one, pray that God opens your eyes to needs around you and gives you the heart and courage to meet those needs. So Lord, open my eyes. And the second thing, pray that his kingdom come and his will be done in your life and through your life. May you be a conduit of what God wants to do. Not so that you're filled, but so that he can fill others through you. Let's pray together. Well, God, thank you. Thank you that we don't have to do this alone. Thank you, God, that you, uh, you don't want us to be burnt out. You don't want us to feel like um, that the expectations that are placed on us are, are just too great. But I know that many people in this room feel that way. We just feel like we can't go on. We feel like we cannot measure up no matter how hard we try. Help us to recognize that we don't have to. Help us to recognize that you value us and you accept us not because of anything we do or any of our performance. We are accepted strictly because Jesus died on that cross. Thank you for that. God, I pray for the people in this room. I pray that you encourage us in the midst of heavy hearts. God, there might be some people in here dealing with depression. Oh, help them see how much you love them and how you, you accept them right as they are, that there is no condemnation in Christ. And God, I pray that you help us to start seeing the world through your eyes. Help us to see needs. Help us to see our responsibility is, is not to fix everything, but just to empty ourselves and, and, and love on people and serve them and meet their needs as much as we can. Oh, Lord, we ask that your kingdom come and your will be done through our lives as it is in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen.